Good morning, everyone. It's almost 10 o'clock and we'll get started in just a minute. Go ahead and wait for the clock to turn over. I hope everyone is doing well. The weather is beautiful. Cold, but beautiful. Okay. So good morning. I am now going to mute everyone and um, you all. So first of all, we are going to enjoy the in-gathering music, Body and Soul by Johnny Green. And uh, Keith Miller is our pianist this morning. Thank you, Keith. Keith. Welcome to worship at Paint Branch Unitarian Universalist Church. I am Susanna Schiller and I'm one of seven worship associates, lay members who collaborate with our minister Rachel Christensen and other spiritual leaders on Sunday services. I'm happy you chose to be here today. Before we move into worship, make sure you know how to use Zoom. Find that mute button, the microphone icon, and make sure you are muted throughout the service so we can all hear the speakers and keep the piano clearly. And bring up your chat screen. The bubble for your chat screen is in different places depending on what kind of device you're using. I encourage you to read the announcements in continuum each week. I have one to highlight this morning. We will hold a memorial service for Emma Sue Gaines Gerson this Saturday at two using Zoom. Details are available on our website in the calendar. Now in chat, please say how many people are viewing from your screen. Type one if it's just you. Later in the service, you will be invited to use the chat feature to post your joys and sorrows. If you are new to worshiping here, please post your name and contact information in chat so we can contact you later, since we cannot greet you in physical space as we normally would after a worship service. And now, Dr. Margaret Flowers will lead us in a call to worship. Thank you, Susanna. Good morning. So this morning, we will talk about racism and health. You'll hear about a great injustice that has been going on for a long time, 
and continues today. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is shocking and inhuman. This information is not meant to upset you, but to inspire you to take action to end it, as we have the power to do when we act together. I invite you to listen and to reflect on the ways that what you hear impacts your life and what we can do to change it. So now I would like to invite Julie Joseph to light the chalice. Hello everyone. I will now light the chalice. We light the chalice to celebrate Unitarian Universalism. This is the church of the open mind, the helping hands, the loving heart, and the radiant spirit. Encendamos esta calice para celebrar el unitarismo, universalismo, esta en la iglesia de la mente abierta, de las manos amigos, del amor, del corazón y del espíritu radiante. So as, as I said earlier, my name is Julie Joseph and I've been a member of the Paint Branch Unitarian Universalist Church for almost a year along with my daughter, Vina Raj. Um, I asked Dr. Margaret Flowers to join us today to talk about the healthcare system because I know well how unjust it is to people of color, to people of low wealth, senior citizens, and people who are sick. Every day I help folks navigate this system and I feel like I'm ferrying them through dark and treacherous waters. Um, it is a system that traps them in poverty and doles out on fair, unjust care. But I'm not going to talk about health care today. I'll leave that to Margaret. Instead, I'd like to share a book with you, a picture book by Monica Clark Robinson. I hope everyone can see my screen. I like this book very much because it talks about a little known aspect of the civil rights movement, the Birmingham Children's Crusade of 1963. Um, it was a part of the, the movement led by Dr. Martin Luther King and it starts in 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama, where children of color couldn't play on the same playgrounds as white kids or drink from the same water fountains. They couldn't go to the same schools or the same hospitals. Dr. Martin Luther King was a witness to this sort of, it, this sort of injustice his entire life, and he wanted to change it. Um, so what he did was he taught people how to, to take bold action and to make the world a more fair place. He taught people that they had to put themselves at risk. A lot of people uh, he talked to were at churches like, like Paint Branch. And some of these people were afraid to do the bold things that Dr. King urged them to do. People all over the world are protesting and marching to fight injustice today. And I'd like to march with them, but I'm a mom a lot like the one in this picture. And I'm afraid of losing my job, getting sick, and not being able to care for my family. Many children in Birmingham who heard Dr. King speak didn't let fear stop them from protesting and marching. They lived in an unjust world and they were tired of it. Dr. King didn't want children to get hurt, but folks couldn't keep waiting for small bits of progress. Big change was needed, and it was long overdue. So the kids hit the streets and they marched.
white leaders told white police officers to douse the children with powerful fire hoses. The police had their dogs attack the young protesters and many children got hurt, but they kept marching. White leaders and law enforcement put the children in jail, but more young people joined the protests and the kids kept marching. White neighbors got angry. Some folks don't believe that all people are equal. And some folks fear that making the world fair for people of color will make it less fair for them. Young people were scared and exhausted, but they kept marching. People around the world saw the children marching, the police, the dogs, and the fire hoses. America was confronted with harsh truths that weren't so easy to ignore anymore. The children offered up their feet, voices, and courage, and they made a difference. Protests led to changes and some unjust laws. Not long after the march, those children in Birmingham were able to go to the playground they had been banned from before. And bold action led to change. Almost 60 years later, in 2020, Children of color experience different standards of education, housing, nutrition, policing, and health care. But what can we do as individuals and as a congregation to create a just society? I'm weary of incremental change. Baby steps can't get you over a chasm. Can we at Paint Branch take courageous leaps like the children of Birmingham? I think we can. And now I'd like to give, I'd like you to give your attention to Susanna, who will perform the chalice reflection. First of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Margaret Flowers, which I should have done earlier, and I apologize for that. Um, Dr. Flowers is an American pediatrician public health advocate and activist. After 17 years of practicing medicine, she became an advocate for a single payer insurance system. Julie was the person who brought her to my attention. And so I'm very excited to have both Julie participating in this service as well as Dr. Flowers with us today. I've always taken access to healthcare for granted. When I was growing up, my parents had health insurance and took us to see a pediatrician for annual checkups. I've even had a doctor's house call. Yes, I'm that old. My whole career has been with the federal government. So each year I get to choose from a selection of excellent healthcare plans. My husband has had complex medical issues for over 25 years and he has had had no problem being referred to experts, first at George Washington Hospital and then at Johns Hopkins. And for a long time, I've recognized that poverty is a significant factor in the access to health care. Here are some generalizations based on my shallow knowledge of the issue. People lacking insurance can't afford to go to doctors for preventative care or they can't afford the medications needed to keep treatable medical conditions under control. So they wait until they're sick, so sick that they need an emergency room to seek help. And then they can't afford the follow-up outpatient treatment they need. Emergency rooms that treat uninsured patients create funding problems for their hospitals. So not all hospitals will treat uninsured patients. Fewer doctors practice in the poor sections of town because they won't get paid by uninsured patients, making it difficult for people living in poverty to get to a doctor. And I think those are all true, but 
I've always thought of the issue of healthcare access as an economic issue rather than a racial issue. The July 14th, 2020 health and science section of the Washington Post helped to disabuse me of this notion. By the way, thank you to Margaret Morrison for pointing me to it. The section was on racism, a public health crisis. One of the topics, pain management, really hit home and helped me to separate the racial and poverty components of access to health care. Getting effective treatment for chronic pain is hard, even if you're white and insured, like in my family. In the 90s and early 2000s, when doctors were too liberal with opioids, an epidemic of addiction was created across the country. As a result, it's much more difficult now to get opioids, even when they're legitimately needed. And when the chronic pain becomes acute and you have to go to an emergency room, there's an element of skepticism there. Are you really in that much pain or are you drug seeking? Until the ER docs have gotten test results showing the source of the pain, they're extremely cautious. This is based on personal experience, by the way. I totally get this and I recognize that they're doing their job, but from the perspective of a patient in severe pain, it's extremely frustrating. And that's from the perspective of a white insured patient. Unfortunately, the situation is far, far worse if you're black, regardless of whether or not you're insured. Numerous studies show that race is a factor in how doctors treat pain. This was documented in an article published in the Washington Post um, Health and Science section of July 14th. I quote, in a national study that included almost a million emergency room visits, black children in severe pain from acute appendicitis had just one fifth the odds of receiving opioid painkillers compared with white children, even after adjusting for other factors. Another study confirmed that racial disparities in opioid prescription are greater in conditions with fewer objective findings, such as migraine or back pain, which depends on a patient's own assessment, as opposed to say a bone fracture, which shows up on an x-ray. Those studies dispel my notions that racial disparities in healthcare are due to a high correlation with poverty. Racial disparities in healthcare have become even more prominent this year with the advent of COVID-19. According to another article in the Washington Post on July 11th, although black people are dying at a rate of 92.3 per 100,000, patients admitted to the hospital were most likely to be white and they die at half the rate. What can be done? Our speaker, Dr. Margaret Flowers, will talk about that in her And now, let us join our hearts and minds in a time of prayer and meditation. As we gather in community, we carry with us life's hurts and its great joys, sometimes sharing these joys and concerns in community can help. I know that I have a great sorrow that Ruth Bader Ginsburg died Friday evening on the eve of Rosh Hashanah. And now, while we listen to St. James Infirmary Blues, I encourage you to submit your joys and sorrows by entering them into the chat bar.
Shall I begin, Susanna? I have a few more words. Okay. That's okay. Let us take a moment to acknowledge all that has been shared, as well as those joys and sorrows that remain unspoken and yet are on our minds and in our hearts. In this moment of quiet, may our hearts open to hope and healing. May our minds open to peace and possibility. May we hold all these and one another in love and kindness so that this congregation may be a source of strength and comfort, courage and hope in the days and weeks ahead. Thank you. Thank you. In Baltimore, where I live, there's a white wealthy L that runs down the center of the city and along the inner harbor and a black butterfly with wings on the east and west side of that L. This is how Dr. Lawrence Brown, who completed his PhD at Morgan State University, describes Baltimore. Baltimore is a hypersegregated city where most of the city's investment and infrastructure is in the wealthy area. Black neighborhoods have experienced decades of disinvestment, leaving them looking like war zones. Blocks are riddled with abandoned homes, some with trees growing out of them, some that are falling down, and roads are pocked with potholes, except in the areas under attack by gentrification. Banks, grocery stores, and markets that the city is so famous for are few and far between in the black butterfly. Although once these neighborhoods thrived with black owned businesses that drew people from all over the city. Baltimore is a stark example of systemic racism, even though it is a majority black city with a majority black government. It was the first city to do redlining a practice where the banks denied mortgages to black families in certain areas. Baltimore spends three times more on its police force, which is trained in its techniques in Israel than it does on the health department and spends twice as much on police as it does on education. At night, police cars with their lights blazing occupy black neighborhoods, watching for the slightest transgression to justify intervention. It is no wonder that Baltimore has the highest percentage of its population in jail of any large city, disproportionately black people. Schools in Baltimore don't have functioning heating or air conditioning. Public housing is being dismantled and privatized. In recent years, Baltimore has taken out bonds worth hundreds of millions of dollars for corporations like Exelon, the University of Maryland and Under Armour to build new facilities without so much as a nod to black communities that are asking for community centers for the children or job training for the adults. Each of these policies has a detrimental impact on the health of black people in Baltimore. There is a 20 year difference in life expectancy between the majority white and black neighborhoods. When it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic, black people have higher rates of infection, more severe disease, and more deaths than white people. This is also true in Prince George's County. These are some of the ways that racism affects health by its impact on what are called the social determinants of health. That is access to education, affordable housing, jobs with a living wage, healthy food, clean air and water, and more. But the disparities in health between black and white people exist even when there are similar levels of education and income. So there must be more to the story. To understand the racial disparities in health in the United States, we have to look to the founding of the country. The United States was built on the theft of land and genocide of Native American people. It was built with the labor of African slaves who were viewed as property and not as human beings. Medicine in the United States was largely defined by European doctors, such as Benjamin Rush, who viewed being black as a disease that needed to be cured in the late 18th century. 
Medicine then viewed black and white people as different species of humans in the 19th century. This view was used to justify discrimination. Black mothers were forced back to work shortly after giving birth. Black people were forced to work long hours in the hot sun because of the belief that they could endure it better than white people. Doctors treated slaves as commodities, objects that were certified for sale or kept just healthy enough to work. When the transatlantic slave trade ended in 1807, slave owners in the United States turned to industrial breeding of slaves. This happened here in Maryland. Young African girls and women were forced to reproduce and their children were sold. Many mothers died during pregnancy and childbirth. These are the roots of modern medicine in the United States. James Marion Sims, the celebrated father of gynecological surgery, developed his techniques by operating on black women without anesthesia, some of them multiple times. The Tuskegee syphilis study took place in the 20th century. Black men were not told that they had syphilis and were not given treatment because researchers wanted to understand the natural progression of the disease. It wasn't until the 1970s when it was leaked to the media that the study was stopped in 1972 when I was 10 years old. A study that is not often talked about took place in a Native American community in the mid 20th century during the uranium rush. Native American miners were not informed of the dangers of mining uranium, even though it was understood that radiation exposure causes disease and cancer. They brought their families to camp near the mines. They cooked their meals and children played close by. Miners drank the water that ran down the rocks in the mines, not knowing it was contaminated with heavy metals and radioactive radioactivity that would later cause cancer and other deadly diseases. For a long time, medicine in the United States was defined by white Europeans and black people were excluded or marginalized. Even today, the percentage of black doctors is about half the percentage of black people in the population and black doctors are less likely to be medical or surgical specialists and are paid less than their white colleagues. So racism is inherent in our medical system. Even though the Human Genome Project determined definitively in 1999 that there is no biological difference between, black, between people of different races, race is still used as a deciding factor in scientific study and in treatment protocols. In protocols that use race as a factor in a scoring system, being black results in a score that is skewed towards less aggressive or lower quality care. Racial bias is implicit in medicine. Medical students and physicians bring the same stereotypes that exist in our society into the examination room. Medical training doesn't acknowledge or work to diminish racial bias, it enforces it, it reinforces it. Studies have found that when doctors are given the same description of a patient, their diagnoses are different depending on whether the patient is identified as white or black. Black patients are viewed as more dangerous, more violent or suspicious. All of this has real impacts on the health of black people. In the United States, blacks have higher death rates than white people from birth through adulthood. Black babies are twice as likely to die as white babies, although a recent study found that when black babies are cared for by black doctors, their survival rate is higher. Black mothers are three to four times more likely to die during pregnancy and childbirth. Black children with asthma are five times more likely to die than white children. And there are significant disparities in cancer outcomes between black and white adults. Remember, these differences are not biological. They are systemic. In the general population, black people are two to three times more likely to have heart disease and die younger than white people. But in a study of more than three million veterans in the Veterans Health Administration, a single payer healthcare system where all people have the same access to care, black people have less heart disease and lower death rates than white people. So this is good news. Racial dis health disparities are not a given. They're not unchangeable. Racial health disparities are systemic and they can be changed by changing the system. And now is the time to make these changes while there is heightened awareness that black lives have not mattered and that our healthcare system is broken. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the deep flaws in the US healthcare system. 
Although the United States is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, it doesn't have a universal healthcare system. Unlike other wealthy countries, healthcare is a profit-making venture and not a public good. Our for-profit system has driven a loss of hospitals throughout the country, but especially in rural communities with higher percentages of black people and urban neighborhoods undergoing gentrification. From New York to Philadelphia, to Chicago, to Los Angeles, long-standing hospitals that served poor and black communities have been closed and converted to luxury condominiums or retail space. When the COVID-19 pandemic began, a lack of testing because the United States rejected the test offered by the World Health Organization so we could make our own, caused serious delays in identifying who was infected and isolating them. Fear of the cost of care, especially during a recession, which is now becoming a depression, kept people from seeking diagnosis and treatment. Stories circulated of people being stuck with healthcare bills in the tens of thousands of dollars for just seeking a diagnosis. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed how ill-prepared we were as a country to handle a healthcare crisis. Public health departments have been gutted. There was no national system to coordinate a response. States were largely left on their own to scramble for supplies, often bidding against each other while the profiteers raised the prices of basic protective gear by obscene amounts. There seemed to be a total lack of understanding of the nature of pandemics, that if we didn't take swift action to control it where there were outbreaks, we would all be at risk. Crises are opportunities for change. They force us to see what is going on, and then we have a decision to make. Will we tolerate the injustice, the dysfunctionality, the real impacts that racism and our healthcare system have on all our lives, or will we demand change? When we look at how social change occurs, it follows a general pattern. For a long time, a problem can exist, and it's not even seen or questioned by society. It is viewed as normal, the way things are. Slavery, child labor, unequal rights for women were all accepted and legal. But then people begin to recognize the injustice. They document it, they teach about it, they agitate about it until enough people become aware of it. At some point, something happens that puts the issue into the spotlight and gains national attention as the police murders of Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, and Sandra Bland did for the racially biased police violence. For change to occur, three things must happen. A majority of people must recognize that there is a problem. They must recognize that the current system can't solve that problem. And they must recognize that we need a new system. That is happening when it comes to racism and healthcare in the United States. Once that awareness and public support exist, what was once considered impossible becomes inevitable. Making change happen requires action. The forces that benefit and profit from the way things are have a lot of resources and they are not inclined to give up what they have, whether it is white privilege and white supremacy or the obscene profits made by health insurance corporations, pharmaceutical corporations or private health facilities. The good news is that while it takes a majority of people to support the need for change, it doesn't require a majority of people to mobilize to make it happen. We have more power than we realize. Think of the children who marched and were able to desegregate their city. People will mobilize and demand change when they have a vision of a better system, one that makes their lives better too. That vision exists. It is called National Improved Medicare for All, a single payer healthcare system in which everyone living in the United States contributes through taxes according to their ability, and every person receives a Medicare card from birth to death that covers all medically necessary care without having to pay for it at the time care is given. There are no medical bills. The government pays for the health facilities and pays the health professionals. This is an important first step, but there is more to do. Systems like this exist all around the world, but some places have taken more steps to reduce health disparities. In Cuba, thousands of physicians have been trained for free in exchange for a commitment to practice in their communities. People from poor neighborhoods are trained as doctors. 
There are health centers in every community and doctors who are responsible for the families that live there. The doctors have a relationship with the families and even go to their homes when it's needed. They also have excellent hospitals and medical institutions. They've developed groundbreaking treatments that have reduced infant mortality, significantly prevented amputations from diabetes, and reduced deaths from COVID-19 and cancer. A small and poor nation under attack by the US imposed economic blockade, Cuba has sent thousands of doctors around the world to areas of need to provide care and guidance, especially during the pandemic. We can no longer accept the healthcare system the way it is in the United States. We must imagine what a healthcare system that is not based on profit would look like one that is based on health and people-centered human rights. That system will never be handed to us by the people in power. They answer to the moneyed interest. We will have to struggle to win it, but we can win it, and the price of not winning it is human life itself. Now we will sing a hymn, 1028, Fire of Commitment, and the words will be shared on the screen. that song. The work that we do in living out our Unitarian Universalist values within our congregation and in the world is only possible through the generosity of our members and friends. 
This Sunday's offering will be received using our Breeze online donation page, or it can be mailed to the church. And now let's listen to Stand by Amy Carol Webb, performed by a band called Shenandoah Run at the UU Church of Arlington. The next song is by a um, folk musician down in Florida. That's where she comes from and where many people know her. But fortunately, uh, John Works met her at a UUA um, General Assembly about nine summers ago. And she sang her song then. It's called Stand. And um, John and I, in another band, were putting together a service that summer, and he brought that song back, and we sang it right away the next week. Um, and we have been singing it ever since, and when I joined the band, they wanted to do it too. So I'm really excited about it. It's everything that a folk song should be. It talks about um, ways that we can do better with each other, but how great we are as a people. So this is called Stand, and it's by Amy Carol Webb. Margaret? Uh, yes, thank you. So as I said, we're living in a time of great crisis. 
But crises, as awful as they are, are opportunities for change. Things are changing because the current systems are no longer sustainable. Something but what, what, the, oops. what that change looks like depends on what we do. Share what you have learned today with others and you'll become part of a wave that is shaping the future to be a world based on respect for human life and protection of the planet a world based on cooperation, not on conflict. People power has won great changes in the past and will again. Together, we can make what once seemed impossible become inevitable. Thank you for allowing me to be with you today. And Susanna, now you're gonna give us instructions. Yes. And let me also th thank you very much, Margaret, for, for sharing with us this morning. After the service, we will have a reverberation session with Dr. Flowers in the main Zoom room, or you can join others for a virtual coffee hour in breakout rooms. Um, but first, let's sing Fuente de Amor, Spirit of Life, together, but with our mute microphones muted. We will now extinguish the chalice. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. It was wonderful to see you. And now we will be sent opportunities for breakout rooms. If you'd like to do the reverberations, then please stay in the main room. Thank you and have a wonderful Sunday.